If I haven't had the chance to meet you, my name is Henry Garza. I am the director of Family Life Ministries here at Village Bible, and I'm so happy to be with you guys today. And um, you probably see me playing the drums back there. So every once in a while, they let me escape the cage, and they let me uh, speak with you here. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, <clears throat> before I begin, we're going to talk about living boldly and just what's going on with Christianity uh, in our society. So before we begin, I want to share some statistics with you, and maybe we'll do a little guessing game here. Uh, in the 1950s, we saw a boom in Christianity. Churches were popping up everywhere. Uh, it was just a, a, a just a like a big tsunami of just uh, people going to uh, following Jesus. At that point, 94% of American adults consider themselves Christian. Let's go 20 years later, in the 70s. Where do you think it went? It went down a little, yes. Mm -hmm. It went to 90%. So 90%, so 4%. Yeah, we never want to go down, but, you know, four, it, it, you know it's not the end of the road. It, it's okay. All right. <clears throat> So we shoot to 2000s. Where do we go? Went down again more, yeah. Now we're at 80% of Americans identify as Christians. 2010, 79%. Right. So, yeah, we're still heading downward, but, you know... Hopefully, hopefully that's the end of it. Hopefully we hit the, the floor, right? That's it. 2024, January, national poll. Who wants to take a guess? 67%? Okay. 55? 60? All right. Who's that? You said 67? You're pretty close. Can you see my thing here? No. <laughs> it's 66% identified as Christian. 66. Now, at the same time, membership in churches dropped. In 1950, 57%. 1960, 63%. 2021, I think, yes. I'm sorry. 50%? 47%. 47%. Church membership dropped below 50%. And that's true today. It's lower. It's lower today. Some churches are in the 25, 30% of the people who, who come to church are members. What led to this point? What brought us here? Decline of Christianity, church attendance, membership. The ugly truth here is that we live in a world where everything has gone backwards. Everything is upside down. We're in a broken world. Things change. Christianity has become a minority. Commitment to church is not a priority. In the same poll from 2021, it laid out the projection of what the leading religion would be in the year 2057. So 2057. The leading religion then is the one that's growing now Anyone want to take a guess? Islam. Yes. Islam. We are living in a day of confusion. Priorities, both personal and social, have changed. Being a Christian, all of a sudden, is a negative thing. We're known as bigots, Bible-thumping simpletons. Christians hate people. I have a friend 
a good family friend of ours, who, who's just a raging liberal, to be honest. <laughs> and uh, she said on several occasions how the Republican Party is just a bunch of Bible Belt Christian nuts who want to take everyone's rights away, everyone's freedoms away. Christianity is being attacked at all levels, individually, socially, everywhere. We are living in a day of confusion. <clears throat> there was a time when church and church functions were prioritized. <clears throat> people went to church. People were members. People went to different things, youth groups, things like that. Now, to be honest, and I'm not pointing at anything here, it's the busyness of life, right? Who's, who said at least once this week, man, I wish I had an extra day? Who at least said once, I wish I had an extra hour of the day? Let's be honest. Who said that, right? There's a few honest people here. Okay. Just kidding. But we're busy. Technology makes us busy. Right? Hey, I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm the first one. It's like, and I'll tell you, right this morning, I woke up really early. I just couldn't sleep because I was thinking about today, speak, being with you here today. And so I started doing the whole scrolling thing. You know, it's 4.30, I think it was. And before I know it, it's 6 o'clock. What the heck happened? Yeah. <clears throat> Priorities. When I was a kid, I played Little League Baseball. Yes, that was a long time ago. And um, at that time, our baseball schedule never had a game on Sunday. Never had a game on Sunday. And if, in the rare occasion, we did have a game on Sunday, it was always in the afternoon. It was never in the morning. Why? because they left that open so families can go to church. Practices, two, three times a week, but never on youth group nights. I lived in a predominantly Catholic neighborhood, so then it was more CCD. You know, like, where's the, you know, are you going to CCD? Yeah, you go to CCD. It was a topic of conversation. It wasn't like, hey, you going to baseball practice? No, it was like going to CCD. Right? So we never had practice on CCD. If there was ever practice, no, there were like two guys there maybe. <clears throat> and if there ever was a game on a Sunday morning, it happened sometimes, you know, it's rain outs and things like that. More times than not, one of the teams had to forfeit because the parents took the kids to church, not to the game. We're living in a day of confusion. <clears throat> We're going to use Hebrews 4, 14, 16. So let's go to Hebrews 4, 14, 16 as our text of the day. And will you please stand with me, please, if you're able, and let's share in God's word. <clears throat> Again, Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, grow near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's pray. Lord, we just pray that the next few moments, Lord, is, is just uh, about you, for you, Lord. Uh, I, I pray that our hearts and our souls and our minds are just open to your word, Lord, and that no one leaves here unchanged. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, you can have a seat, please. Thank you. If you're taking notes, couple words that are important. Yeah. Confidence. I want you to write that down on the top of your page. Confidence. And 
assurance. We'll get to those in a minute. So, we live in a broken world. But we learn in our reading because of Jesus, we learn that we have a confession. This confession is a call to action for believers at the time of the writing and for us to remain steadfast in our faith and confession of Jesus as a Savior and our High Priest. The author at the time encourages the readers, even though in the face of prosecution and trials, to cling to their faith in Christ and not waver in their commitment to him. This holds true for us today. We face challenges. We face temptations. Everybody faced temptations. How many times this week did you face a temptation? Big or small? You know, one honest person. <laughs> we hold fast to our conviction. The inward conviction about Christ and our outward profession about Christ. We learn that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. Now we're talking about two different titles to the same person. The man born human was given the name Jesus, the humanity of Jesus. Son of God, the name given to the deity of Jesus, the deity of Christ. Two people in one. The Son of God assumed a complete human nature with all its limitations, but without any surrendering of his divinity. So he serves us as a representative, a substitute, and an example to live. The Bible describes Jesus as eternal, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, and immutable. Jesus Christ is equal with God the Father. He is worshipped as God, the deity of Christ. <clears throat> we learn that Jesus is a high priest. Now, what's a high priest? In the Old Testament days, the high priest was the uh, guy who went in on the day of atonement, went and went to the tabernacle or the temple, took the sacrifice of blood from a, from a sacrificed goat, went into the tabernacle temple where the Ark of the Covenant was, sprinkled that blood over the Ark for the people. It purified the sins of the people for a year. Jesus became our high priest by becoming human. He was sacrificed for the sins of the people, and he entered the true temple of God, heaven. Jesus became the perfect priest. He is the priest that we need. He's holy. He's innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. And because Jesus is this kind of priest, we can approach him with boldness, knowing that we will receive mercy and grace from Jesus, who intercedes for us. Jesus took our place. His priesthood is transcendent because of his ascension into heaven. That's when he took his rightful place at the right hand of the Father. His priesthood put all other priesthoods into a minor status. As our priest, Jesus represents us man to God and re represents God to man. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus is a unique priest in that he is both God and man. He is both God and man. So with that, 
we learn that Jesus went through life like us, but one difference, without sin. Jesus set foot on earth and identified with humans by becoming human. He can sympathize with us because he knows our struggles. He, he experienced our struggles. He knows our weakness. That weakness was within him, but he didn't yield to it. That weakness, temptation and sin. Temptation is not the sin. Yielding to temptation is the sin. Jesus, in everything he faced, faced it as a human. But his deity didn't yield. In verse 15, there's a double negative. Is there a do not and unable? That strongly affirms that we do have a high priest who can identify with our weaknesses. He faced that temptation. So we learn that Jesus is the Son of God. He's our high priest, and he went through life like us, but without sin. So that brings us to the next point, that we can have confidence. We can have confidence. Verse 16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I love that image, the throne of grace. I love that image. Approaching Jesus at the throne of grace. The word throne refers to the kingship of Jesus, his sovereignty. We can approach Jesus with confidence. We can boldly come face to face with Jesus. And when we do, it gives us peace. Especially at the time when we really need it, at the time of our death and judgment. As many of you know, and some of you may not know, uh, when COVID hit, it got me bad. <laughs> it, hit, it, 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 it got me bad. In uh, 2020, November, uh, I was hit with COVID, and I was really sick, and ultimately, I needed a double lung transplant to save my life. And I have the nine scars to prove it. <laughs> During my sickness, especially at the height of my sickness, I prayed constantly, and my stubbornness didn't want to give up. But my body was something different. Even the doctors were giving up. I met, I met the perfect characteristics of a Hispanic man, overweight, some other things, bald, no, I'm kidding who, if they receive, if they get COVID, and if they get it put on a ventilator, they're going to die. That's it. There's a thing they're saying, anyone with brown skin and COVID is going to die. So my doctors were pretty much thinking, okay, they were kind of, they didn't give up, but they were definitely heading that way. One nurse didn't give up, and that's a whole different story, which I'll be happy to tell you if you want to ask me. My spirit wasn't giving up, but my body started feeling like it was giving up. The strain of it was, was getting to me. So I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. One night, middle of the night, I was praying to God, and a psalm came to mind about God being the rock, God being the cornerstone, the foundation of our faith. Jesus. So I prayed to God. I said, I can't do this myself. I can't. I laid my life, my health, 
I laid my family at the foot of the throne, at the foot of Jesus. I laid everything down, and I told, and I told him, Lord, if your plan is for me to get better and survive, then I know you're going to put all the right doctors in place. I know you're going to put all the right medicine in place. You're going to put everything in place for it to happen and for healing. And if that, got, if that happens, Lord, then obviously there's something you're calling me to do. Tell me what to do. Now, if any of you know, if you say, tell God, tell me what to do, you got to an answer. <laughs> I also prayed, Lord, if, if your will is to take me home to you, then I know that you're going to give my family, you're going to give Michelle and the kids, you're going to give them everything they need to move on with life. You're going to put the people that they need in their life, the church that they need in their life, everything. I know it's all in your hands. I know you're going to provide. I'm confident that's going to happen. I approach God with that boldness. Not because of me, because, you know, I was like, well, you know, all right, God, you owe me this. No. It was a confidence from Jesus and the confidence that he, gave, he gives us to come to him. There was an assurance that God would listen to me. We have an open invitation to go to God boldly and to pray to him. And he'll hear our prayer. And we can expect him to answer our prayer. Now, it may not be the answer you want. Who's been down that road? But he will answer. We can pray with confidence that God will answer us. And with that, that means that confidence gives us encouragement and hope. That confidence gives us encouragement and hope. There's a famous writer, his name is William Arthur Ward, and he once said, flatter me and I may not believe you. Criticize me and I may not like you. Ignore me and I may not forgive you. Encourage me and I will not forget you. Encourage me and I will not forget you. There's a Chicago musician, his name is Daryl Davis. Uh, Famous musician. He's played with, like, the great B.B. King, Jerry Lee Lewis, Bruce Hornsby. Uh, He's 68 now, uh, still in the music business, Uh, so he's, he's still doing that. But on top of that, he was also an activist. And one of the things he wanted to find out was, why do people hate Why do people hate other people when they don't even know them, either personally or culturally? So what did he do? Daryl, African-American, what did he do? He went to the Ku Klux Klan. And his his goal was to befriend one, one of them and find out why someone like that would hate, hate him for the color of his skin, but also hate people. And where does that hate come from? And he wanted to, to find that out. The other thing, his other goal, was he wanted to encourage him, or whoever he's going to meet, to move away from that life, that lifestyle. That was his hope. You know, he was hoping to encourage the person to leave, and he was hoping that it was going to happen. So he befriended one of the top, I don't even know what they call them, but the top Klansmen uh, there, Grand Puba, I don't know. And uh, he befriended him. He got to know him. He... pretty much was invited to rallies. The guys, people liked them. The Klansmen actually invited him to be his son's 
godfather. They became friends. Ultimately, he took off the robe, took off his hood, presented it to Daryl and said, here, you can have this because I don't need it. I don't want it. I, I just don't need it. And he turned away. He turned away from that life. That man then turned to his friends and he turned 200 men to walk away from that hateful life. If it wasn't for Daryl's boldness and his will to encourage and his hope that God would show up, that man would still be living that hateful lifestyle. We are faced, maybe not with that same kind of danger, but we are faced with situations that where we have to live boldly because we are living in a broken world. We will need encouragement. We will need hope. We will need to give encouragement and give hope in a world that's broken. Society is broken. This confidence gives us freedom. Two kinds of freedom, literally and figuratively. Freedom from sin, the bondage of sin. Freedom to not look back, but to look ahead to what God has in store for us. In Genesis 19, there's a story of looking back, story of Lot. God, not happy with what's going on at Sodom and Gomorrah, decides he's going to destroy. He sends an angel to take Lot and his family out of there, save them. Angel's trying to get them out. And for some reason, Lot's just kind of like, they're just kind of just, yeah, okay, they're like kind of, Whatever. Angels literally had to grab them by the hand and pull them out and take them on and send them on their way. With one instruction, do not look back. Just don't look back. For some reason, Lot's wife looked back. The consequence, she turned into a pillar of salt. I wonder why she looked back. Maybe she'll look back for the same reasons we look back on things that God had asked us to let go. God was taking them to a better place. God has a better place for us. But are we willing to follow? Will we keep our paths from making the destination God has waiting for us? I, I joke around, but truthfully, too, that if you guys would have met me 20 years ago or so, you guys wouldn't like me. Pastor Steve still doesn't believe me. I've been telling that for like five, six years now. <laughs> I'm like, I'm telling you, you won't like me. I don't like myself. I did things, I said things, I've, it's, yeah, I, I can't, yeah, I just did so much that was so against God's will, God's word, that it's, uh, it's, it's shameful. And I spent years dormant due to that shame. I was stuck in the past. I couldn't look ahead. It stopped me from listening to God's call. It stopped me from continuing going for my master's degree in Christianity. I went back. But you know, a two-year program took me like four years because I kept stopping myself. I kept getting stuck. But here's the question. What blessings did I miss out on because I was stuck? Worse yet, what blessings did someone else miss out on because I was not, because I was stuck, and I was not looking forward, and I was not listening to Christ? And this is true at church. Last week at our campus annual membership meeting, Pastor Steve gave us a, a, a state of the Plano campus review. And thank the Lord, our campus is growing. We're doing well. 
It may not be all rainbows and butterflies and sunshine, but things are going well. Now, before I continue on, I do need to say, though, that what I'm speaking of here is not about our theology. Our theology is correct. Our theology is sound and based on the Word of God, based on the Bible. What I'm talking about and what I'm referring to here is matters of the flesh and preference. I've seen churches be divided because of the color of the carpet. I was in a church, and there's no joke, I was in a church where we're divided and we spent an hour and a half in a council meeting talking about and arguing about the type of salt we're going to use in the parking lot. Okay, the environment's important. I'm not saying it's not. But we could have used that time differently. We were stuck. We were stuck. So as a church, we need to protect ourselves from falling into those traps. We should not look back. We cannot allow, we cannot allow ourselves to be frozen by personal opinions, preferences. Those should be submitted to Christ out of love for the church. What blessings will this church miss out on if we don't focus on the future, if we get stuck? Worse yet, what blessings will the church, or will someone miss out on, someone out there who hasn't been here yet? What are they going to miss out on? Their relationship with Christ. We need to keep that in mind. Isaiah 43, 18. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. We are living in a day of confusion. We are living in a broken world. But through Jesus, we can live boldly in this broken world. This is our call to action. Make the commitment to hold true to your beliefs. Make the commitment to make your Christianity the church priority. Make the commitment to stand up for the gospel. Through Jesus, our high priest, we have the confidence which brings us that peace, that encouragement, hope, and freedom. Live boldly, brothers and sisters, following Jesus. Jesus is the priority of our lives. Make this commitment and do not yield to the brokenness, temptation, and sin of the world. Amen? Amen. Will you please stand with me?